All right. Well, James, you ready to go? Yep, All I'm right. ready. Karen, you ready? <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's kick this off. It's uh, 1 p.m. Eastern uh, Standard Time. Good afternoon or good morning, depending where you're at. Maybe good evening if you're overseas. Um, my name is uh, Chris Young, uh, and with me is uh, James Sutherland. James, say hi. Yeah. Good morning uh, from the West Coast here. Um, James Sutherland. I'm actually with the uh, FA Air 360, the uh, working with all the safety teams. So, um, yeah, welcome everyone. And I guess uh, from here, uh, Karen, you want to say hello? Yeah, Karen, uh, please, uh, as one of our co-chairs, Nick couldn't be here with us today. He's uh, traveling overseas, but Karen, thank you very much uh, for joining us. I'll open it up to any comments you might have. Thanks, uh, Chris and, and James. Um, welcome. For those of you that are wondering who I am and where I came from, uh, I have uh, uh, passed, or the, the baton has been passed from Wayne Fry, who many of you have worked with over the years, uh, to the uh, in the role of the FAA or the government co-chair position here with the USHST. And so I'm I'm, I'm very excited to be part of this group and uh, and you know support this role. I, I do come from a, an Army aviator helicopter background, so that was my uh, my helicopter uh, experience outside of the FAA. So uh, I'm really excited to to be here for this opportunity now. Um, and like uh, Chris mentioned, Nick is actually traveling uh, overseas, but he did want to uh, send his. Uh, his warm regards, uh, first day of December. So uh, it's hard to believe we're already here into this, uh, I guess this holiday season. So just uh, uh, again, there's a full agenda today and, and Chris, I don't wanna take any more of that valuable time. I'll pass it back over to you. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Karen, appreciate that. And uh, again, appreciate everyone joining. I, I know there's, there's uh, attendees still coming in uh, or, but we'll continue moving forward. I've got the agenda up on the screen. We've got some, some really great topics and, and even better presenters and uh, participants. We, we, of course, thank everybody uh, who volunteered their time for today to, to participate. Um, we, we're going to go through our, our monthly accident briefing. Uh, then we're going to have a, a great topic discussing the 5G radio altimeter interference that that many of you all might be aware of, but we'll get a briefing uh, from Lee and his team at the FAA. And then we're gonna come into uh, the uh, RC digital cockpit, uh, co-pilot, excuse me, development that, that MITRE has been working on. Uh, I think you'll all uh, like that. It's pretty pretty cool stuff. And uh, we'll give a brief presentation on that. And then uh, our, our, our friend up in, in cold Alaska, uh, Cliff uh, Jillian with Alaska Department of Public Safety is gonna talk to us about cold weather operations. I, I think, uh, he and, and his team up there are pretty credible in, in dealing with cold weather. So look forward to his uh, recommendations that it, and experiences. Followed up uh, uh, from, from a good friend of mine, Duke Puharch at Siller Helicopters. We're gonna talk about maintenance safety. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, James Dangerfield from the FAA is gonna further emphasize uh, the importance of, of maintenance and, 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 and how we should be conducting our helicopter pre-flights after especially heavy maintenance. And so um, we look forward to all those topics. Uh, we'll be doing some polling questions uh, with everybody uh, throughout uh, the session and there'll be opportunity for you all to, to participate uh, and ask questions. We, we encourage your engagement. Uh, um, we want you all to participate as much as possible. You can put something up in the chat if you'd like. Um, there's uh, information that if you wanna share, please do so. We'll try to share back with you any links of the videos and things like that. Um, we're we're, we're going to be able to get some wings credit and AMT credit as long as you're logged in with your um, e same email address for uh, the wings uh, and AMT, then uh, we'll review that and, and get some credits to you as long as you stay online and participate, uh, we'll get you there. But with that, uh, let's, uh, let's roll right into our, our first uh, polling question. James, you want to leave that one? Sure. Yeah. Um, as everybody uh, sees up there for our first topic. Um, yeah. Over the 
most recent 10 years, what helicopter industry sector has accounted for the most US flight hours? And so just uh, please check one and we'll give it a, a minute or two until we start seeing the, the responses stabilize and then get into the presentation. Looks like we've got good good participation there from the participants. <laughs> All right, I think we're sharing. James, are we sharing or uh, Ashton? I think we're sharing those results. When we review those, yeah, I think the so so far the the results in um, aerial application fifteen percent, helicopter air ambulance forty one percent, air tour twenty two percent. Aerial observation, twenty-two percent. Nice, and so, uh, so that that leads right into our our next uh, um, presentation. Uh, and Lee's going to be able to answer that question for us. Uh, Lee Roskop with the FAA. Um, he's gracious to to provide a, a lot of input to our community and um, a lot of work that he does. Um, and so for this first section uh, uh, topic he's going to talk about our um, monthly uh, accident uh, briefing. Thanks Chris. Well I thought the uh, the, the polling question was a, a good primer uh, just because um, since the last time we had an opportunity to uh, to meet um, the FAA released the results of the uh, 2020 uh, general aviation um, part 135 activity uh, survey so as a uh, I think many are aware of that's what we use to do our, uh, our rate calculations uh, that we're, we're tracking progress with for our, our USHST uh, work. So in terms of the, uh, of the polling question, um, for those that I uh, guess helicopter air ambulance, uh, you get the uh, very close but no cigar prize. It's the, uh, that, was, that was the one I think that was the, uh, the obvious uh, pick that was out there, but believe it or not, it's uh, aerial observation. Uh, so uh, it, it's very close, though. Usually, they're within uh, percent of each other um, each year, and, and you'll get to see uh, some of that uh, when we uh, when we go through some of the results of the uh, of the GAM Part 135 uh, survey in, in a few slides. So, uh, getting right into it, uh, the uh, the first slide here is just where we're at in terms of uh, the USHST's goal. As I think you're uh, you're probably aware of, is uh, to reduce, reduce the five year average uh, fatal accident uh, rate to uh, 0.55 or less. By 2025, so we've got three years and a month uh, remaining to uh, to reach that goal. And as we stand right now for the uh, 2017 to 2021 uh, time frame, uh, for those uh, those years, we're at uh, 0.73 uh, per 100,000 uh, flight hours. So, and uh, you can see as uh, we've reviewed over the last um, last several meetings, uh, we've we've had got a bit of a shallow upward uh, trajectory. So uh, we we need to uh, get that moving in the other direction if we're going to reach that. 0.55 um, five-year uh, average fatal accident rate uh, in the uh, in the three years we have uh, remaining towards our goal. So framing this just a, a little bit differently, um, our goal was established based first on this five-year uh, baseline from 2014 to 2018 of 0.62 per 100,000 flight hours. On the far right, the green bar is what the uh, what the goal is uh, by the end of 2024. And for the average in progress, what we saw on the last slide is 0.73. For those years that will be uh, included in the 2020 to 2024 goal, which is 2020 and the 11 months of 2021 so far, for a 0.72. For our current year, 2021 uh, only, uh, 0.66. And then for the uh, the month that, that just uh, concluded, November, it was, uh, was 0.45. So looking at that through just different lens of uh, of counts versus uh, versus rates, the uh, the blue line uh, shows what the five year cumulative fatal accident count was for 2014 through 2018, and then the green line shows how we have uh, we've tracked uh, this year uh, against that historical uh, count. You can see uh, as we get to the uh, the far right side of the uh, of the chart there, we're, we basically track to uh, historical trends uh, this year in terms of the count of uh, of fatal accidents. So, I, of course. The, uh, the hope is for December that uh, you know we'll, we won't uh, won't advance any further. It'll it'll just stay locked in at 18, 
to uh, to finish the year. But that's uh, that's where we stand right now through November is uh, is 18 uh, fatal accidents for the year. Uh, this just gives an idea of those years that are feeding into that uh, that five year average fatal accident rate here on the uh, on the right side of the chart. One of the things I want to point out for those that uh, that study these uh, closely, you'll know that uh, 2020 the uh, the rate went up since the last time we had an opportunity to uh, to get together. Uh, it was at uh, 0.71 uh, when we did this briefing in September, and now uh, that's been adjusted to 0.79. And the reason for that adjustment, as I mentioned, the uh, the FAA's GA and Part 135 activity survey uh, results were uh, were finalized, and the uh, the flight hours uh, came in lower than uh, what had been forecast, and also lower than uh, what we had tried to uh, adjust for with regard to um, any kind of COVID impact and COVID influence. We've been continually adjusting the the flight hours uh, down just based on uh, data that we we've been able to gather in different parts of the different industry sectors but uh, it came in even lower than what we had projected. So lower denominator means a higher rate. So that's where that, uh, that 0.79 uh, came into. So, and then for the current year, as uh, we talked about on the previous slide, we're tracking at 0.66 for 100,000 flight hours. Uh, fatality rate. So uh, the previous slide was about fatal accidents. This is about a uh, number of uh, you know, occupants that were, were killed uh, through the course of each one of these, uh, these years. Uh, for 2021, we're sitting at 1.29 uh, per 100,000 flight hours. So downward uh, trajectory, uh, shallow one, but uh, still downward uh, for, for that. Uh, we would like to get uh, back to where we were at least in 2015-2016 uh, timeframe, if, uh, if not lower. And then for uh, overall accident rates, which uh, encompass both uh, fatal and non-fatal events, um, really 19, 20, and 21 uh, are are aligned in terms of not much uh, not much change there. Right at uh, around four per hundred thousand flight hours, or the vicinity of uh, 3.87 uh, to be exact so far for uh, for 2021. And now looking at uh, fatal accidents as they have uh, been broken down by uh, by industry sector for January through uh, November. For those who've tuned in for most of the year, uh, no surprises really on this chart because uh, we had Three total fatal accidents for uh, October and November, two in October, one in November. And uh, two of those were in the uh, personal private sector, which has been leading for uh, most, if not all, of the, uh, the calendar year, and um, then followed by aerial application with four events. And those, those two obviously are accounting for more than 50% uh, of our fatal uh, accidents this year. And then we get into uh, a bunch of the other industry sectors that are represented with uh, just one event each. So again, 18 total fatal accidents for this year. Looking at overall accidents, both fatal and non-fatal by, uh, by industry sector, uh, same two heavy hitters, uh, personal, private, and uh, an aerial application. Um, the, uh, the parenthetical you see there too, by the way, is the, uh, is the count and then followed, followed by the uh, percentage. Uh, so those two, and then a pretty steep drop off to instructional training, which is, uh, is bringing up uh, third place uh, there, and then several of the industries that have, uh, have six or less events to, uh, to round out the, uh, the rest of the chart, accounting for the 105 total uh, accidents that we've had uh, thus far in 2021. Now, I mentioned the, uh, the GA survey uh, results as well as um, the polling question that we had. As you can see, uh, broken down for uh, this first column, uh, 2020 is a percent of US uh, flight hours of, for these uh, various industry sectors. The, it shows uh, percentage-wise that uh, aerial observation and helicopter air ambulance were, were identical. Um, that's that's true if you round it. Uh, if you uh, if you go out a couple de decimal spots, aerial observation uh, beat um, a helicopter air ambulance uh, by just uh, some fractions of, of a percentage. There, and you can see on the on the far right column uh, how that compares to the uh, the percent of of hours um, that they accounted for among uh, U.S. helicopter hours flown for the previous uh, decade. And what I tried to do is highlight it in green are those areas where you saw more than a, uh, a couple percent um, increase and then highlighted kind of this, uh, this reddish, reddish orange is areas where you saw a, a decrease. Now across the board, um, you know, 2020 being, um, being such a weird year with, uh, with the impact of, of COVID, um, most of the industry sectors did see uh, some level of decrease. Uh, actually, aerial observation was one of the few that uh, that did not. 
uh, but but some you can see took a took a bigger hit than others. Uh, instructional training um, hours, you, you can see that there were, they were three percent less uh, of the pie in 2020 as compared to what they'd been for the previous decade. Um, our offshore, which is the, the oil and gas uh, flights, uh, again three percent less than what they were for overall helicopter hours. Um, and then uh, Air Tour Part 135, uh, it looked like it took the uh, took the bigger hit in terms of its its rank order on this uh, on this chart in terms of uh, hours. And then the, the last uh, last chart I wanted to put up since we had the uh, the hours uh, available for 2020. Now we can uh, we can look at some industry specific uh, rates. And as you uh, as you look at these, just keep in mind that um, you know our overall uh, rate for encompassing all the industry sectors uh, for uh, for U.S. Uh, helicopter activity is a five-year average of 0.55 per 100,000 flight hours. So uh, these this is how it, it shook out for um, the industries that had a, a fatal accident in 2020. The parenthetical represents the raw count of, of fatal accidents for, uh, for each one of those. Um, so you can, you can see, for example, aerial observation as kind of testament to the number of flight hours that it uh, accounts for. Uh, four fatal accidents, but because it's at the top of the stack in terms of uh, hours flown uh, in the uh, in the U.S. for helicopters, uh, you know the, the rate is is lower than some of these other industries that only had uh, a single uh, single fatal event. And then you know the the best best news sectors are at the bottom of the of the chart where you you see um, all the uh, all the cases that were where there were no uh, fatal accidents that uh, that occurred in 2020 uh, for those industry sectors. Uh, thus, their uh, the rate was uh, was zero. And the last thing I wanted to uh, to mention was uh, we, we showed this chart uh, in a lot of the different USHST uh, presentations that we give uh, because our, our focus areas have been these uh, these top three occurrence categories uh, because for the area uh, for the years of 2009 through 2018 those uh, those three aviation occurrence categories uh, accounted for uh, more than 50 percent of our uh, our fatal rotorcraft. Uh, accidents, so 56% for that for this 10-year uh, time period. The uh, the blue line is uh, the blue bar, rather, are uh, raw counts for each one of those aviation occurrence categories, and that the red line uh, just shows you the cumulative uh, percentage. Now, the reason that uh, that I have this included in here and, and and brought it up, as you can see in the little text box there, uh, we had uh, we recently had the opportunity to uh, to close out uh, the. Um, the analysis of the aviation occurrence categories for um, the events that occurred in 2014 through 2018. As many are aware, uh, when a fatal accident happens, it can take anywhere from uh, a year to uh, to 18 months, two years uh, for the uh, the NTSB final report uh, to be issued on that. So the last of the NTSB final reports were issued for that 2014 through 2018 um, data set. And so um, the uh, safety analysis team was uh, was able to uh, conclude the work and and lock these percentages in. Uh, if you have an old chart of this, uh, you'll note that the uh, the percentages did not change uh, very much for each one of these categories. We're talking, you know, one two percent at most uh, for for any one of them. Uh, but uh, you know, it's good to have the uh, the latest information, and, and this can now be considered finalized. So that uh, that concludes uh, the uh, monthly uh, accident uh, update, and uh, I'll toss it back to uh, to you, Chris. Awesome. Thank Appreciate that. Lee. Maybe some feedback. Um, as always, you know, I think that being able to look at those statistics um, is very helpful from an industry perspective. So appreciate all the hard work that you and your team do and really appreciate y'all updating, uh, updating that last slide, updating the statistics related to, to the accident investigations being finalized. I think that's really helpful to make sure we do have the latest and, and most current information and going back to the GA and, and part 135 survey again for folks, you know, next time that that <laughs> starts and I don't know when that starts next Lee for next year. Yeah, so I, I think uh, the, the survey typically goes out um, around February timeframe, Chris, and it's it's usually like a February to June uh, window on, on that. And again, the, the more participation uh, there is, the uh, the tighter the uh, the standard error is on that you can get very good um, analysis um, you know even with as low as ten percent participation usually we're somewhere uh, between forty and fifty five percent participation depending on uh, you know which sector you're talking about but the more participation the better on that for sure yeah definitely so 
um, please everyone that's on the on the call make sure when that survey comes out you you participate and provide that data it's really really important i don't i don't see any questions right now coming through chat or the uh, q a uh feature let's see hands I, I do want to make sure i i uh... I reiterate if I, if I uh, misspoke during the presentation or I had a slide mislabeled, all the um, all of the counts are calendar year for USHST. I know when I send out the FAA's monthly accident uh, briefing via email, those are uh, fiscal year uh, numbers. But for USHST, uh, we we do all our uh, our metrics by calendar year. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, all right. Well, again, I don't see any questions or concerns. Um, so we'll uh, we'll press on. Uh, and before you start again, Lee, uh, James, do you want to go ahead and lead us in our next polling question? Yeah, sure. Um, Ashton, can you uh, pull up the next? Uh, oh, there it is. Um, yeah. Going into the topic number two, uh, what is your biggest concern regarding 5G implementation? I know this is the concern for uh, UHS, HST, and just about everybody else that flies. So go ahead, uh, same, we'll give, leave it open for a few minutes and uh, wait for the results. And James, this is Chris, just a clarification. One of those questions is cut off, uh, answers is cut off. The potential aircraft hazards stemming from 5G implementation are not clear and there has not been sufficient testing. So that's the complete response. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, it actually showed up correct on my side. So hopefully everybody else uh, can read all the possible responses. And Chris Young, how are we? Oh, there we go. All right. Um, it's pretty clear on this one, 54%, the potential aircraft hazards steaming from the implementation are not clear and there has not been sufficient testing. Um, obviously led the group fall, quickly followed by choice C, followed by D and uh, no one uh, chose A. So with that, uh, back to you, uh, Lee. All right, and I think that's, uh, that's one of those where there's uh... <laughs> There's there's no um, there's no wrong answer to it. Uh, so you know it's it's pretty much based on how much or uh, how little um, you know folks have been um, you know involved in the uh, kind of various various discussions and and how five uh, G continues to kind of um, you know bubble up either in, in in news or or reports and that sort of thing that you've seen. So um, for for this particular topic. Uh, there is a there's a group of us um, from the FAA on the rotorcraft side, uh, from both aircraft certification and also from from flight standards. We both fall under the aviation safety uh, line of business, and we there's a, a sub team of folks. I've, I'm serving as the mouthpiece for this today, but that um, or we've been asked to look at different aspects of of the uh, 5G uh, C band interference with uh, with radio altimeters. So. Uh, if those folks are on, you know, some of them are names that uh, if you're a regular with USHST, you'll recognize uh, folks like, you know, uh, Nolan Crawford, Tom Luberspeck, uh, Eddie Miller. Um, you know, there's many others that are on there from the aircraft certification side. Um, you know, Andy Shaw, some of our flight test pilots like Al Wilson, John Jordan. So um, anyway, for if, if any of you all are, uh, are tuned in out there and uh, and there's something you want to add in the, uh, in the chat, uh, please do so. But the reason that... Um, that we thought it was relevant uh, to uh, to bring this up is um, folks are are really kind of all over the map on what they uh, what they know or they don't know about uh, about 5G. Um, you know, I was talking to one of my uh, my friends who works in uh, the air ambulance uh, community, uh, you know, several weeks ago about this, and said, uh, "So, so what have what have you heard about 5G?" And he's like, "What what exactly are we talking about? I mean, are we talking about cell phone 5G, or are you talking about something else?" And I, I don't think that's particularly uncommon unless you know like I said you're someone who is uh, who's followed this uh, very closely so what I thought that um, you know we do um, you know no one is going to leave here as a as a 5g expert there's folks that have been following uh, this for you know multiple years now um, you know certainly in closely in 2021 but this is really intended as a as an education and awareness opportunity if, if it's not something that 
that you've thought about uh, much. So I'll just get into the, uh, the background, some of the potential risks, uh, regulatory considerations, uh, why in USHST uh, we would care about this. And then if you're looking for more information, um, since like I said, you're, you're definitely not going to become an expert in the, uh, in the 10 minutes or so that we have uh, today, but there's places that you can go where you can, uh, you can certainly find out uh, more. So background on it, on uh, radio altimeter and 5G uh, C-band. So the FCC is uh, going to allow new 5G C-band services to operate in the 3.7 to 3.98 uh, gigahertz uh, C-band range of the radio frequency uh, spectrum. Now, initially the turn on date uh, for that was uh, going to be December uh, 5th to 46 markets. Um, Verizon and AT&T AT &T were uh, two of the, um, the bigger uh, Purchasers of uh, space when the, in this spectrum when it was uh, when it was auctioned and finalized I think it was in February of uh, 2021 uh, so this year but they've delayed uh, voluntarily delayed their implementation until January 5th uh, 2022 now how this relates to equipment on the aircraft is radio altimeters or you know choose your vernacular you want to use uh, radar altimeters RAs or rad outs I just use rad out in this presentation because it's it's kind of easier to spit out but operate in the 4.2 to 4.4 uh, gigahertz range. So the RTCA, which is the Radio, Radio Technical uh, Committee for Aeronautics, uh, assessed that the, the 5G C-band interference on, uh, on route outs uh, in the U.S. and published a report of this in October of, uh, of 2020. I've, I've got uh, that reference in sources for more information on one of the later slides. Basically, it was a 231-page report and it looked at uh, user categories, uh, or use categories of transport airplanes, small airplanes, and, uh, and rotorcraft. And what they concluded is that uh, telecommunication systems in this 3.7 to 3.98 uh, band can cause harmful interference to rat outs. And that's the result of not only emissions that are within that 3.7 to 3.98 um, range, but also spurious emissions that can occur uh, from, from 5G uh, into that 4.2 to 4.4 uh, range where, uh, where rad outs uh, reside. So the, uh, the RTC re a report said that the result can be degradation in rad out operation, loss of data or erroneous uh, data. And again, this, can, this isn't isolated to just a helicopter thing. Uh, it can affect transport airplanes, small airplanes and helicopters. So the concern, at least as expressed in the RTCA report and the literature that uh, we've seen in the FAA is from base station uh, emissions. So you're talking about your 5G cell towers that are out there and you know, to a lesser extent, but still uh, on onboard user equipment, uh, not on handheld user uh, equipment uh, on the ground, at least not at the, uh, at the present. So that is, that is the very much super high level of uh, background on, uh, on 5G and what the, uh, the fundamental concern is as related to, uh, to rat outs. Now, from a risk standpoint, you could lose the, uh, the following uh, benefits uh, in the presence of a 5G C-band interference. I wanna be, uh, make sure I emphasize that we're talking 5G C-band because one of the things that uh, has come up is, you know, folks have said, well, now I've had 5G uh, for, uh, for months, so, you know, how come we haven't seen anything, uh, you know, happen yet on on aircraft that's related to that? What's well, not? It's not 5G within the uh, the C band uh, range. So that's you know that's that's the portion of the spectrum that we're talking about. So obviously, if you're if you're getting uh, misleading or erroneous um, readings, you're not going to get uh, an appropriate displayed indication of height above uh, terrain from your rad out. Um, the rad out is obviously. Um, integrated into, uh, into other systems, depending on the, uh, the make and model of, uh, of your helicopter. Uh, from a severity standpoint though, uh, how heavily dependent, um, you know, the rad out information is used is, is largely based on, you know, what are you doing with the, uh, with the helicopter? What operation are you, uh, are you involved in? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of cases where, you know, it may just be providing you supplementary uh, safety information. I think the last, uh, last study, that I did, 98% of our helicopter hours in the U.S. are flown, uh, flown VFR. So, you know, you're, you've got your, your eyeballs to, to tell you, you know, from, uh, from experience, uh, how high you are above the ground. Uh, you have your barometric altimeter that you can use. Uh, you also have your, your radar altimeter if you're equipped with, with one uh, to, to provide you that supplementary safety information. So depending on 
the uh, the pilot preference technique, uh, what the company recommended practice is, or your phase of flight, um, it may be a piece of equipment that's used a little or a lot. Um, so for certain operations, though, in certain phases of flight, there's there's potential higher risk severity because a pilot may have to make a decision that is reliant solely on the rat out information, or that rat out may be integrated into something like an autopilot that's reliant on uh, on input in order to um, ensure you know, appropriate aircraft control. So those are those are the the cases where you'd have uh, have potential risk. Now, there's also the regulatory consideration uh, piece of this. So for MVG operations, as uh, folks I'm sure who are using MVGs know, one of the uh, requirements out there under 14 uh, CFR 91205H7 is that the rat out will be functioning in a normal manner. Well, with what is presently known, um, it's assumed that the rat out won't be functioning in a normal manner if it's in the presence of 5G C-band interference. So given those circumstances, um, it's anticipated that operators won't be able to comply uh, with this, this rule. So in, in anticipation of that, uh, HEI actually submitted a petition for exemption uh, to this rule. So if, you, if you're not aware of this, uh, this, this link will, uh, will take you to that petition for uh, exemption. It was posted on uh, by the FAA on November 16th. Uh, the comments are due to the FAA by December 7th. So if you have a, um, a strong feeling about this uh, one way or another, this is your opportunity to uh, participate in the in the public process uh, and make a comment to this uh, this uh, exemption petition for exemption uh, if you think that's uh, appropriate. Now, the the second thing to discuss with regard to regulatory considerations um, for for those that are operating Part 135, uh, you'll you know that this is uh, this already um, that rotorcraft operating Part 135 have to be equipped with an operable FA approved radio altimeter or FA approved device that incorporates a radio altimeter. So presumably by operable, the, the, the rule means one that is not providing erroneous or, or misleading information or actually, or no data, depending on uh, how the interference manifests itself. So again, based on what is presently known in presence of 5G, it's anticipated operators won't be able to comply uh, with this rule. And again, as part of the same petition for exemption, uh, HAI uh, included uh, this rule on that posting that was uh, posted by the FAA on November 16th and comments closed on December 7th. So again, if this is, is something that, uh, you know, if you're a part 135 operator and uh, you're all for this petition and you, know, you, want to, uh, you want to put a comment in there to that effect, great. If there's something else you want to put a comment in uh, about this, uh, that's, that's uh, appropriate as well. Uh, again, this is, is really just uh, making folks aware that this petition, petition for exemption is out there and it's the opportunity to, uh, to participate. So how does it relate to, uh, to USHSD? Well, as I mentioned on my previous uh, presentation, you know, our, our top three uh, occurrence categories are lost control and flight, unintended flight into IMC, and low altitude operations where the helicopter hits obstacles, uh, an object, or a train. And we focus on those three because you know, the first bullet, as it says, we're all about fatal accident reduction in the USHSD. We're trying to, to drive that fatal accident uh, rate down. So uh, in terms of 5G and, and radar altimeters, a degraded route out function may result in an increased risk, again, depending on what you're doing and specific use that you have for the uh, route out of an increased risk in these, these three occurrence categories that we're trying to, to knock the numbers down on uh, where we're, we're focusing our efforts. And likewise, we want to make sure that uh, there's good awareness of, uh, of the potential uh, 5G risk so that, uh, so that operators can plan to mitigate accordingly. Um, you know, if, if someone isn't aware of a risk, it's hard to, to have any kind of mitigation in place. So hence the reason for this, uh, this sort of education and awareness message. And then finally, you know, if you observe anomalies in the functioning of the rat out and suspect 5G C-band interference, uh, report it to the FAA, whether through air traffic, flight standards, the district office, the FISDO, uh, service difficulty report, SDRs, or any other point of contact you have with the, uh, with the FAA. And you know, what would probably be most valuable in that situation as well is if, if you had a location um, where you, location and time where you, where you experienced some kind of uh, anomaly. So sources for more information on this, um, I'll be the first to raise my hand that uh, I am not the be all end all oracle of uh, 5G uh, interference information, not even close uh, to, be, to be honest with you, uh, but we do know that it's important to get this message out. So wanted to take the opportunity to do so. 
one of the first places I would uh, I would go to is the FAA uh, released uh, an SAIB, a Special Air Awareness Information Bulletin, uh, error 21 18 uh, last month, um, recommend with recommendations for rat out manufacturers, uh, aircraft manufacturers, and also the operators and pilots. So I'd, I'd um, recommend that you go and you, you read that. I mentioned the RTCA's uh, report. It's 231 pages, so you'll uh, definitely want to pace yourself on that one. But there are sections that apply across the board to um, transport airplanes, smaller planes, and rotorcraft, and then there's there's sections that are dedicated specifically to each one of those products. So you know you can kind of carve it up that way and and uh, make that 231 pages a little more digestible. And then uh, I, HAI has has really tracked closely uh, with this. Uh, you know for those that um, get the uh, the rotor daily, HAI is regularly posting uh, the latest news articles and those sorts of things on there. Uh, Rick Kennan, who's on HAI's board um, wrote a, a nice article in their September 2021 um, Rotor Magazine issue on this. So if you haven't read that, um, I would uh, I'd recommend that as a read. And then also on HAI's website under uh, the government affairs and advocacy part, I didn't put every single um, you know link that they have on there, but these are a lot of the, uh, the ways that you can track uh, what's been going on, what presentations have been given by industry to the FAA or to the FCC, um, different aviation coalition letters, that uh, that are out there, so uh, so please you know use the resources that HAI has uh, has put out there because uh, they are abundant. And finally, closing thoughts. Um, you know, Chris Young is an SMS expert, and maybe he can offer some more uh, comments on this. But uh, you know, one of the things I thought of is just consider how your existing SMS can be used to you know assess, mitigate, and communicate risk potential related to this uh, this five G rat out uh, interference. Uh, you know, when we we talk about uh, you know the um, safety policy, safety risk management, safety assurance, safety promotion, you know, going through all those, those four pillars. Uh, th this is a, a real life opportunity to, to do this in advance of when the, uh, the rollout date is supposed to be for, uh, for 5G. And then just to reiterate the point I had on a previous slide, if you encounter what you think is rat out interference from 5G, uh, please, uh, please report it. Uh, so that, uh, that being said, I will, uh, that's a conclusion of my presentation and Chris, I'll uh, get back to you again. Awesome, Lee. Thanks so much. I really appreciate that. Um, we, uh, I posted the uh, SAIB uh, document in the chat for folks, and I think Chris, Chris Hill put uh, some links in there as well uh, to, to help uh, folks be better informed uh, about the issue. Uh, in related to your question about SMS, exactly as you kind of sta stated, you know, when you look at the four pillars of SMS, the key is that your, your organization or your operation is reporting uh, issues that occur internally. You know, make sure your pilots, uh, when they, if they experience some, some, some interference that they make sure they report that within your SMS uh, hazard reporting uh, system tool, whatever it may be. And then that, you know, that you all are able to, to take action and then help provide data back to the FAA related to, to encounters uh, of problems that you had. Um, there were a couple uh, comments. There was one uh, comment uh, from a gentleman, uh, Mr. Uh, Weinholt. 5G has a range of 1,000 feet, which is much less than 4G. I don't know if that has an, a, a special uh, is, issue related, you know, if you're flying above 1,000 feet, you know, uh, AGL away from a tower, perhaps you is less likely to have interference. I don't know if that is specifically addressed in the uh, airworthy uh, uh, bulletin or not? Do you know that? So I know in the uh, in the RTCA report uh, for um, use categories two and three, which is both small airplane and uh, helicopters, uh, they they did uh, projections up to like twenty five hundred uh, feet AGL, and for that there was still there was still interference that was beyond. Uh, or in layman speak, what I'll term a satisfactory uh, level. Now, uh, that being said, one of the uh, one of the things I think that is difficult for uh, for a lot of folks on this is there hasn't been really robust aircraft level uh, testing on this. So there's a lot of unknown uh, on you know how this how this is going to manifest itself uh, for you know particular you know rat out boxes that are installed on you know particular aircraft and the integration aspect of that. So um, Again, I don't want to get too far out of my uh, my lane. We probably need a uh, you know a, a systems engineer 
to, to really do that uh, that question justice, but that's that's what I know from reading the RTCA report and some of the uh, discussions we've had. Okay, great. And, and the the link for that report's just been uh, put into the chat. So if anyone wants to access that that report, they can. There was a uh, second uh, comment um, uh, from from Jeff Bird. If, if was there any actual five G interference data that that we have or was used in the analysis? No, not in the uh, not in the RTCA uh, report, and you know I, I think that that kind of goes back to my my earlier uh, comment is we we really would benefit from um, a lot more you know testing you know aircraft specific box specific that sort of thing um, you know one of the things that it talks about in the uh, the SAIB you know for for uh, operators and, and pilots is you know try you know, knowing what your aircraft is, what installation that you have is, you know, uh, starting that dialogue, whether it be with, uh, with the aircraft OEM, um, with, uh, with the rat out supplier, that, that sort of thing to try to get a better idea for your, your particular situation. Okay. And then the last question came in from uh, Chris Lowenstein. He mentioned uh, ARS, ARS Technica recently published an article that mentioned C-band has been deployed in Europe and Japan with much less separation than the U.S., and have no reports of any issues. Uh, CTIA stated that at least 200,000 5G base stations are operating in at least a dozen countries with no reports of interference. What is the FAA position on this? So uh, what I've what I've been told, uh, Chris and Chris, on on this one is the uh, is the power level difference is uh, is what makes the U.S. situation um, unique from um, some of what's been seen. In the in the international community, that the uh, the power levels of five G that uh, that are going that um, can be you know can go up out um, in some cases dwarf what they've been in some of these uh, these other countries. Um, one of the other things that had been shared with us in some of the discussions is that there had been um, more uh, protection built in in terms of buffer around airports and that sort of thing in some of these other countries where five G has already been. Um, deployed, and then I, as I as I mentioned, you know, some of the cases it's 5G was deployed, but it wasn't deployed in the uh, in the C band. So I think you know uh, Chris Longstein was asking specifically about the C band. So that's that's what I know about it so far. Power levels being the uh, the big one. Um, I know you know just this week there was uh, an article you know published. Um, I can't remember if it was Wall Street Journal or one of these other um, news sources that said. Uh, that Verizon and AT&T had talked about reducing their power levels down for the first six months after deployment, just as uh, as a way to maybe ease fears regarding you know those higher power levels that are going to be deployed in the U.S. Now, what they mean exactly by how much that's going to be dialed down, I, I don't know that it, it wasn't stated uh, in the article. Okay. I appreciate that. Well, I think the key thing is, is the awareness, uh, making sure everyone, it, you know, clearly understands that there is a potential. Hopefully there's, there's not an impact, but, um, you know, appreciate you providing the information and what the FAA is doing and what HAI is doing to help with this issue. I know they've done a lot of work uh, to, to help raise awareness you know, within the industry and, and, and um, with legislators and so forth. So, um, for everybody uh, participating, you know, going back to the SMS, you know, risk management, you know, just keep aware and, and, and it didn't, if anything happens or you think there's a, an, an effect of interference, make sure you document it and, and, and provide that data. Let's see, um, another comment. Uh, let's see, other countries are not deploying in the same manner as, as other countries, even though others are deploying, there are several differences. Yeah, so to your point, you know, with the C-band and not C-band power levels, there's probably going to be di different varying levels of potential impact and not. So again, just keep keep an eye out there and hopefully uh, we, we, we don't experience anything. And But if we do, let's, let's report it. Yeah, and, and uh, just a kind of a shout out to the person who posted that. Uh, Nolan Crawford is got uh, exemplary knowledge on this topic. So, and he has been working it uh, much longer than than I have. I've only been involved for a couple months. Nolan, I think, has been working this um, and from a flight technology standpoint uh, in in the FAA for the better part of a year or so. Uh, Nolan, not to sell you out, but uh, if you have like detailed questions, Nolan is an excellent excellent resource to ask.
Awesome. Well, folks can put those in the in the chat and uh, maybe Nolan can help answer some more. So thank you, uh, Lee. Thanks to your team. Uh, we appreciate that, that that information. Very important. Bet, Chris. Thanks. Awesome. All right, let's uh, let's roll right to our next uh, uh, polling question. Uh, James, if you can help facilitate. All right. Um, thank you again. Um, yeah. Next uh, topic is uh, with Nikki and Matt. Um, polling question is regarding RC digital co-pilot development. Do you or your operation include the use of an electronic flight bag as a standard operating procedure? So yes, no, or not applicable. And again, we'll give a few uh, minutes and see when we uh, start getting a consensus on uh, the response. All right, we got about 66, 69% of folks that are online have participated. All right, let's go ahead and uh, throw that, that answer up there for everybody to see. All right, yep. Um, so 40% yes, 16% no, and 44% not applicable. So with that, let's uh, hand it over to Nikki and Matt. Great. Thanks, James and Chris. Um, so this is Nikki Armour. I'm just going to do a quick brief and then Matt's going to get his presentation up. Um, so most of you I've worked with and uh, back in 2017, several of us sat uh, on the USHST and went through some safety enhancements. Um, HSC 100 was the digital co-pilot that got deferred. Um, and just recently, uh, we were able to get some funding and Matt Pollock and Steve Estes and their team has been uh, leveraging the original digital co-pilot that was uh, uh, originally came out for the GA side. And so in the in 2017, the USHST, when we, we were doing the review, um, this topic came up. So we've leveraged some of the original DCOP um, standards from G GA work enhanced it into the helicopter side. So it's kind of emerging. And that's where Matt and uh, Steve are gonna show you guys a little bit of the work they've done, how it's progressed specifically for rotorcraft um, and see where we can go from there. So this is the initial uh, demo, I believe, or intro to DCOP for the USHST. Great, Nikki, thank you so much. Um, so with that, uh, Matt and Steve, go for it. Yeah, thank you, everybody. I uh, appreciate uh, you taking the time. Steven's going to drive the slides for right now because we're going to get to a point where we're going to show a little video demo and he's going to narrate it so it makes more sense for him to advance slides. Uh, I'll just give a quick overview uh, for those that haven't heard in a while or, or don't recall uh, the work that we've been doing both on fixed wing uh, as well as now on the rotorcraft expansion of digital co-pilot really uh, aims to bring some cognitive assistance to the flight deck. Uh, so for those not terribly familiar with cognitive assistance, it's really the concept of providing tools or features that are, are aiming to aid users as opposed to replacing users, right? It's trying to provide notifications and guidance and responses to the user that are very context aware, context sensitive, and uh, really aim to provide the right information at the right time in a format that you know the user can easily digest. Um, in this case, you take in a lot of inputs, a lot of different uh, types of, of algorithms. These are reasoning algorithms. Sometimes you use speech recognition. You've got context sensitivity, etc. Uh, we've tuned those types of algorithms specifically for the flight domain. Uh, you know, we started, like Nikki said, with the general aviation fixed wing. Um, and we've now expanded that and, and then modified the algorithms to be applicable to rotorcraft operations as well, specifically in the, uh, the context of phase of flight reasoning or uh, trying to infer from sensor data what phase of flight the operation's currently in. Uh, obviously, uh, as everybody here knows, fixed, uh, fixed wing and, and rotor wing aren't terribly similar all the time in that uh, in, in phase of flight, uh, fixed wing don't hover terribly well. Um, so, you know, we had to do a bunch of things to, to tune that, um, but we did tune our various inference algorithms uh, and some of our speech recognition to, to really tailor the concept of cognitive assistance 
to the flight deck. Um, the quote unquote product that we've, we've uh, developed is really a research prototype. And Stephen, why don't you jump to the next slide while I talk here. Um, it's really a research prototype aimed at providing us a platform where we can experiment with various types of algorithms and, and techniques to aid the user. Uh, it is not intended to end up directly in the user's hands. Um, what I mean by that is we won't build an EFB product that is meant to compete with a commercial product that's out there or any avionics or anything like that. Our goal is to support the FAA and support groups like the USHST uh, in improving the safety record of, in this case, helicopter operations, certainly. Um, and to do that, we're going to do the research. We're going to do simulation testing. We're going to do flight testing of various algorithms. We're going to work with users and operators, you know, over in kind of an ongoing process to to refine those those features. And then we want to get them out into the hands of the users by getting them into the tools that you already use. So for those that responded, I guess with that 40% and 16%, uh, I'd say that's what about a little bit better than two to one of operators where it was applicable are using uh, some sort of electronic flight bag. The idea would be to get the features that seem to make the most sense from a safety enhancing perspective into those tools. So we're not looking for people to go and, and pick up a new fully featured product. Um, as we see on the screen right now, realistically, we take a whole bunch of inputs in uh, from the pilot, from onboard sensors, from uh, any data that we can get a hold of wirelessly, specifically in this case, we, uh, we do our prototyping on an iPad. Uh, we have a lot of onboard data. That data is fused together, run through a couple of processors to do things like infer phase of flight, infer what destination uh, you know, may be targeted to understand when a pilot is intending to make a maneuver as opposed to unintentionally maneuvering uh, so that we don't provide too many false alerts. Uh, we process that into a set of cognitive assistance features, notifications that are maybe aural, haptic, visual, et cetera, uh, and, and may also then have some sort of downstream data outputs. Um, that kind of is just the overall architecture of digital copilot. On the next slide, we we'll talk a little bit about the key features that exist right now, and then we'll kind of go into a quick demo, talk about some next steps, and then we've got time for some questions. Uh, right now, I was talking about phase of flight. We, uh, we had to develop two different phase of flight inference algorithms uh, to support the rotorcraft operations. One is kind of re uh, relies on some fuzzy logic concepts. Uh, the other is much more deterministic. And we found that um, they have their pros and cons. And when you fuse the outputs of them together, you can come up pretty reliably with, um, with a current phase of flight. You know, this again is in real time in the cockpit. So we don't have the advantage of looking at a flight after it occurred to go back and infer what might have happened. Uh, instead, we have to do it only with the data that you've got available in real time. To go along with those two phase of flight algorithms this year, so far, uh, this fiscal year, we've been able to develop a, a few different, uh, you know, more safety related algorithms. Uh, they're listed here. We uh, started off with doing some, uh, just some conformance bound, um, notifications on helicopter routes that was really used as a way to tune our phase of flight inference algorithms. Uh, but it is there can you know, notify a pilot that is on a helicopter route or appears to be on a helicopter route, if they are getting uh, near to or exceed an upper or lower bound uh, altitude bound of, of that helicopter route as published. Uh, we've developed based on input from uh, from some operators. Uh, notification of an impending vortex ring state. And then again, when it develops into what appears to be an actual you know, settling with power of vortex ring state situation, a notification of that um, to, to help the pilot realize what's happening a little bit earlier maybe and avoid, avoid some of the issues that go along with it. Uh, we've also developed an algorithm to help, be, uh, help make aware, make the pilot aware of conditions that are, um, that are ripe for a loss of tail rotor effectiveness type of, of environment. 
Uh, more recently, we've started looking into providing information on, on traffic that's uh, in the, you know, a, an area around an intended landing zone, um, whether that is a, a heliport, heliport, Copter, or sorry, a heliport and airport, or a uh, you know a, just a, an off airport landing zone. Um, another thing that that had come up in some discussions was awareness of the en route decision point. Uh, as we understand it, uh, the en route decision point is sometimes maybe maybe the the decision that needs to be made at that point is sometimes neglected due to um, various external. Uh, influences. Uh, so uh, we figured it might be helpful to notify the, the pilot uh, in real time that it appears that the, the situation has evolved to a point where they need to make that decision as to whether they're going to continue the mission as planned or you know turn back or, or land right away, or I guess uh, switch to IFR and continue that way. Uh, so that's what we've done so far. We've got some other things uh, teed up for future work, but First, let me jump over to Steve and let him talk a little bit about uh, the, the more mature features we have so far, and then we can talk about what some next steps are and uh, what we might be asking of, uh, of the team. Great. Uh, before I get started, any questions for, for Matt or I on what you've heard so far? If not, we'll just uh, do a quick demo. All right, we'll keep trucking. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to show a, a quick demo of phase of flight, Vortex Ring, Hilo Route, and LTE notifications. We've got two types of Vortex Ring notifications. One is settling uh, monitor vertical speed, that's on the left side, and then settling escape Vortex Ring state. Uh, the green one is, uh, I think the vertical speed of descent is like 100 or 150 feet per minute. And then if you start exceeding that in a hover, uh, then we do the escape vortex ring warning. And you'll see that here in just a moment. Uh, in the center, we've got the altitude route notification. So as y'all know, most of these HEVA routes have uh, altitude restrictions associated with them. In this case, all the Washington ones are at or below. So we provide a notification when you reach the ceiling of the route. And then we provide a notification if you bust that ceiling for the route. Uh, and then finally on LTE risk, there's two components to that. One is the LTE risk notification and the other is the wind ring. So this is based on an L uh, AC, the FAA issued on uh, LTE. It uh, basically stated that if you have winds in excess of, I think it was eight knots, I can't remember the exact number, and you're traveling less, less than 25 knots over the ground, and you have a tailwind and, or a left crosswind, then you have an LTE risk. And I'm sure that'll differ by airframe and this is all tunable. Uh, but if there are winds greater than eight knots and you're traveling slower than 25 knots over the ground, we provide the wind ring, which is around own ship there in the center. Uh, it's the wind sock. Currently those winds are coming out of the south, south, southeast roughly. Uh, and then if you are, if those winds are in fact a left crosswind or tailwind, we provide the LTE risk notification. Not saying that you're having a loss of tail rotor effectiveness, just letting you know what the wind conditions are uh, so that you can uh, be aware of those as you probably depart or arrive in area given the speed. Okay, uh, and the other thing you'll see here and I'll point out is phase of flight uh, as we go through the demo video. All right, so let's see what we got here. Right, I'm just going to fast forward a little bit. There we go. All right, on the left side is our helicopter. On the right side is uh, Digital Copilot. I'll note Digital Copilot in this video was hooked into Microsoft Flight Simulator, which is a simulator on the left side. So this isn't faked on the right side. We're getting real data. And of course, we're getting excellent data because it's from a simulator, but it's all real data, uh, making real decisions, real inferences, all that sort of stuff. Uh, you can see we're on the ground. We've got the LTE wind ring right off the bat. The winds are 10 knots at 320. So that also means we've got the notification because the winds are a tailwind. Uh, once we get above about 25 knots, and actually first we'll make a turn, the notification will go away because it'll no longer be a tailwind or left crosswind. Uh, then as we get above 25 knots, the wind ring will go away and we'll start to see a couple other little things. We're gonna join this route four Hilo route, we'll bust the altitude on that and then see a few other things. So let's go ahead and start watching.
our phase of flight is right up here in the top center of the taxi phase of flight. In a second, it'll switch over to takeoff. Our notification for LT has gone away because now we have a right crosswind. Now we're into takeoff. Notice that was inferred. We're not leaving from a helipad or airport. So we're just completely inferring that. The wind ring goes away because now we're going greater than 25 knots. Now infer to departure phase of flight. We've not given it any flight plan information or anything like that, although we can, uh, we do have an ability to design it an ad hoc uh, landing zone, so an uh, off-airport landing zone. Now we're in the low in route phase of flight, turning on to the helo route. Here in a second, I'm going to bust the helo route altitude and we'll get the thousand knots, of, uh, or rather, thousand foot. So there's the altitude deviation. Uh, I'm going to fast forward just a little bit. So the aircraft will come down and slow down, and we'll look at the vortex wind, uh, vortex uh, ring state alert. And I'll note that uh, I'm descending fast enough, and I'm a terrible helicopter pilot. <laughs> so I'm descending fast enough that we go right into the red alert for the vortex ring state. That and we'll just sit in that for a second, then we'll begin to accelerate, make a turn back, and we'll show an approach to the landing. And accelerate, fast forward just a wee bit here. There we go. We see this little green patch of ground in the top right or mid right of the view. That's going to be the landing zone. Uh, right now we're descending and slowing down. So behind the panel, the system is already thinking we're probably in an approach, but it develops what we call a belief state. So it, it wants to see a good bit of evidence before it says, okay, it really is an approach uh, <clears throat> in spite of what it might look like in the instant. So in a moment, it'll go into the approach state and then uh, into the landing state as we slow down below 25 knots, again, because the winds are above 10 knots, uh, we'll get the LT wind ring, and that'll sum us up. Second floor. Now we're into the approach phase, being the top center digital copilot. And here a second, it'll go into the landing phase. Notice I just went straight in on this approach. The approach and landing phases, they still work just fine if you were to do a circling approach or anything like that. This is all integrated with the fixed wing phase of flight, so it can infer approach and departure from runways and traffic pattern movement and all that sort of stuff. All right, so that's the demo in a nutshell. Uh, if there's any questions, we can answer them or, or uh, turn it back over to Matt, and he has some questions for y'all, I think. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, Yep. So I guess the next steps after that, we've got we got a few uh, algorithms that we want to look at on the horizon. Um, things looking at the stability of approaches, uh, coming up with some better ways to identify and disseminate local hazards, etc. Um, but I think what the the most important thing is for everyone to understand MITRE's kind of tech transfer process, uh, and, and then what what we might need some help on. Um, MITRE has a fairly robust tech transfer process. It's the way that we uh, develop ideas and technologies and then get them out to, to government or industry or both. Um, in this case, and maybe Stephen, if you just jump onto the last slide, um, you know, what we do, we, you know, we work with, with you guys, we work with uh, Rotorcraft IAT, we work with various operators through various venues, as well as the, you know, the FA sponsors to come up with ideas and, and research them and develop them to a point where we think they're mature enough to be transferred to the industry. And what we like to do is develop a uh, kind of longstanding relationships with various tech transfer recipients, uh, you know, whether that's uh, our, our sponsors directly or, you know, say EFB manufacturer software developers directly. Um, we, we like to develop those relationships long term and get into a, a situation where we can tech transfer these concepts, the algorithms behind them, 
the user interfaces that have been researched and, and developed and whatnot, uh, and and make sure that they have the easiest access to that knowledge as possible, so that they can refine it, get it into the products that that the operators are already using, so that they can start to benefit from it. Um, and while we have some nice relationships with various folks, uh, it, it always helps to have more, uh, and certainly better relationships with them, so that we have more people that we can get this this technology out to. Um, but what we found is that really to to have a, a great the greatest effect, uh, we they need pressure, right? We need the the operators, we need industry to help uh, motivate the developers to incorporate some of these technologies because obviously they've got other things to do as well, um, and we just need them to be aware that these technologies exist and and are ready for them, and that there's demand from the the end user because they, you know, realize that there, there could be a benefit to them from a safety perspective. So I, I think really our, our ask uh, of the USHST is, is for support there for any help we can get in, in, in applying um, that motivating pressure to the, the developers of the programs that you all are all are already using. Um, to to help make that tech transfer more likely and to help get those features that make most sense uh, out into the products that you're using. And with that, I'm I'm done. Um, so if there's any questions, I'm happy to field them. Uh, otherwise, we'll turn it back over to, to Chris. Well, uh, Matt, Stephen, and Nikki, thank you so much. Um, I've been fortunate to see this before so you know i'm still amazed at, at the technology and how how awesome it is potentially going to be for for folks just, and just to you know maybe a question for steven uh in that demo those alerts that were popping up you know that is the proposed alerting system through whatever efb product yeah. a, an individual is using is that right yeah i mean we have our own interface and and we try and provide uh, some guidance on basic human factors principles but obviously whoever ends up implementing this stuff and for example when four flight implements our stuff they they do they do things their own way they have their own notification system they use something kind of similar they put alerts in the in the middle of the screen uh, and we do have some methods to allow the pilot to pipe the iPad or whatever the device is into their headset as well. So you can get those right in your ear. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, and, and also just, you know, the, the data that you're using, you know, your, what you're creating is based upon data that you've received from uh, some, some operators that are participating, you know, as an example, through the Rotocraft IAT and, so aircraft that have the capability for some type of data, uh, flight data monitoring or, you know, flight data monitoring like equipment hums, you know, that that's really important as well to help contribute to this process. Is that right? Absolutely. We'll take any data we can get. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, Chris, to, to clarify it a little bit also, um, it doesn't just rely on those that have the flight data monitoring type of capabilities on board. Uh, you know, you can use something just as simple as the onboard uh, barometric sensor, as well as the GPS on the iPad at the, you know, kind of bare minimum, and then working up to, to wireless, um, like little miniature uh, attitude heading reference systems, uh, and then up to some sort of, you know, fully integrated capability, which would obviously be the best, but uh, limits the, the number of people, limits the usability a little bit. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, appreciate it, Matt. Um, I, I guess you know the you know, point I was trying to make is <laughs> encourage folks to 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 embrace whatever flight data monitoring capability that you can afford, install, use, uh, whether that's hard equipment in the aircraft or through some type of app on your iPhone, iPad, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, you know the the application of, of, of the usage of the data is, is so powerful and just viewing that playback uh, is an awesome tool as well right for for helping with training and so forth uh, evaluating performance and things like that so you know, excellent point yeah sorry I misinterpreted that a little bit yeah you're absolutely correct awesome and 
If I could, uh, Lee had a question in the chat, probably just easier for me to yeah, respond please. verbally. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so Lee was asking about uh, things like uh, loss of uh, flight and uh, loss of control in flight, unintended IMC, uh, low altitude. So we've got a whole range of features that are developed for our fixed wing stuff that are also included in the helicopter stuff. So, for example, we have the ability to monitor weather along the flight path and avoid the, uh, rather alert the pilot if the MINs are decreasing or they go from, a, say, a VFR condition to an IMC condition, either at the destination airport or any point along the, the path. Uh, we have a, a kind of unique set of terrain avoidance uh, algorithms that uh, try and try and make some of the terrain avoidance that we see now a little bit smarter, uh, a little bit fewer false alarms and give the pilot some idea of just exactly how severe the threat is. So we give um, vertical speeds to escape the terrain. Uh, so you can know, you know, is this just terrain that's 100 feet below me or I'm going to have to climb it, you know, 10,000 feet a minute to get out of here. Uh, so we've got some of that built in. And then as, as Matt mentioned earlier, we have this uh, in route departure point feature that we're uh, developing specifically for uh, Hilo, and that'll certainly be applicable to the, the IMC, uh, rather VFR and the IMC uh, stuff. So we've got a nice set of feature there that over, I don't know, it, it must be close to 60 different features in Digital Copilot now, and almost all of them, with, with a few exceptions, apply to the Hilo stuff. Uh, and, and we're just trying to develop some Hilo specific stuff at, at this point, if that makes sense. Matt, does that make sense? Yeah, that, that does. Uh, you know, one other thing, I guess, to, to add to it is uh, related to the uh, obstacle um, thing. You know, we've been working on incorporating no tamed obstacles as well as published obstacles and be able to provide uh, information directly to the um, to the to pilot when those obstacles become potentially become an actual uh, issue for them. Um, so we only display them when the aircraft seems to be at low enough altitude to be impacted by them. Uh, and then you know we're working on some some future base uh, potential capabilities uh, to take in some more local hazard information that operators are collecting, uh, somehow digitize and centralize that to be able to provide to other users as well. Well, again, I, I think it's amazing what you guys are, are working on. So, you know, Matt, Steve, and Nikki, thank you so much for bringing this information to, to the folks uh, at the U.S. Helicopter Safety Team, to the participants on the webinar. I think more to come, obviously, and, and, and I look forward to that technology helping to create awareness for the pilots, especially single Single uh, you know, pilots that you know flying by themselves don't have the the ob obvious uh, reliance on a co-pilot, and now this digitally can be provided to them to, to 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 help that situation awareness and making sure they're they know what what potential hazards they may be uh, encountering. So yeah, thank and thank you for providing a venue for us to get this information out. Yeah, awesome. Well, y'all take care. Thanks again. Appreciate it. We'll, we'll go ahead you. and transition to our. Our next topic, and James, we'll go ahead with that polling question. Yep. Uh, yeah, there's the polling question. So as we enter winter, uh, cold weather operations, um, at what temperature do we need to make operational and risk mitigation adjustments? Uh, 5C to minus 18C, minus 18C to minus 30C, or minus 30C and below. So yeah, we're kind of looking at that 40 uh, degree Fahrenheit to zero, and then uh, 22 and below, so. All right, we got questions coming in. We're about 50% right now, participants providing in their inputs. Numbers are going up. All right, let's go ahead and uh, put up the results. Ah, uh, so all, all of the above, 50%. Uh, responded then we got a uh, 33 of the at the first kind of that initial icing the uh, temperature and then eight and eight percent so with that uh let's hand it over to cliff great 
Cliff, if you can uh, come up on uh, camera, there you are. How are you, sir? I'm cold, but I'm here. It's uh, <laughs> hello from Anchorage, Alaska. Um, good morning, everybody, and uh, uh, Chris and the team. I'd like to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to, to talk a little bit this morning. I don't have a huge PowerPoint presentation or anything specific like that. I just have a few a few minutes to to share some experience of a little over 30 years of flying in Alaska. Um, uh, just for a point of reference, it's 22 degrees Fahrenheit here in uh, Anchorage, and at one of my bed down bases up north, it's 35 below zero right now. So uh, Alaska's uh, deep inside of the Arctic. The Arctic Circle passes through our state about halfway uh, between north and south. And the temperatures that I used this morning are kind of some factors that, that I've used over time in helicopter operations. And, I, and I've kind of talked or written some notes for this discussion about tactics, techniques, some procedures, some operational decision-making that we use. Um, a lot of this is based in um, operational experience and it's more of a question uh, spawning type presentation uh, to get folks talking about cold weather in the Arctic and subarctic. I used the temperatures on our questions this morning to capture, like many of you did see, is to capture that frost and uh, freeze and thaw cycle the plus five to minus 18 degrees Celsius in any aircraft operations and helicopters in particular is a, is a very dangerous uh, time or not a dangerous time, but a time that we need to take into consideration for risk mitigation, mission planning. I broke my discussion up talking about the crew, the machine and the, and, and the mission. Um, it's solely based on the environment and we'll talk about what I call the sub or plus five to minus 18. In the Department of Public Safety, uh, most of you are familiar with our helicopter operations. We had a horrible accident about eight years and nine months ago that was made national news of an Interver 9C. Um, and uh, I came on board here about eight years and six months ago and have been working with our department and developing uh, a program for aerial operations and airborne law enforcement in the state of Alaska. We, we have policies and procedures and we operate um, down to and including negative 40. Um, at minus 40, uh, we, our department stops operations unless it is actually a, a life limb or eyesight top operation. Some of the things that we talk about when we're in that uh, freeze and thaw section of plus five to minus 18 with the crew is that we always, we have, we have a progressive, a progressive ha hazard there with um, people will get wet when they're trying to pre-flight and things like that. So it's always important to have training and management oversight that we have the right equipment for our aviators and the ground crew members so that they don't become wet and then go on a mission and it continues to get colder and colder and you're exposed to hypothermia and things like that. So that five to 18 degrees minus 18 can really stack the cards against the crew and it, and, and it can be the first link in a, uh, in a survival situation if something goes wrong during a mission. So that's one of the key things that, that we think about in those temperature ranges. Um, as we get a little colder talking about the crew from minus 18, which is zero Fahrenheit, down to negative 30, all of, the, all of the hazards that you recognize at plus five to minus 18 are still in effect. Um, however, at that minus 18 degrees C, we've, we've seen and I've seen some pretty serious uh, issues with things like petroleum, oil, lubricants, fuel burns, um, uh, Jet A, Jet A and Hunter Low Lead will burn, will burn the skin almost like uh, sticking your hand in a pan of boiling water at zero degrees, minus 18 C. So, so you know, protective equipment, um, having gloves on, just small contact gloves when you're pre-flight and touching the aircraft, it's, it's critical to train that and provide that and have that and watch the crews as managers to make sure that it's done. There's also another element when you start getting this cold, is that by human nature, people get in a hurry. So abbreviated pre-flights, um, quickly removing covers and, and, and blocking panels and wanting to jump in and have a giddy up and go type attitude is another cumulative hazard in that sub temperature range and below. Um, so by developing programs where we have a pre-flight period that's followed by a warming period, in other words, the crews will go to their aircraft They'll get them ready to go, but there's a built-in break between the time they finish their pre-flight and they depart. Those are some of the tactics that we use. And we follow that with a formalized checklist. And then we've also used our flight risk assessment tool to build a, to build a task in there that allows the crew to recover from being exposed to the cold weather 
before they actually go on the aircraft and depart. That's just a tactic. When it gets less than 30 degrees uh, Celsius for the crews, um, we always take into consideration the critical cr criticality of the mission, the need to go. Can we delay the mission? Um, if the mission is going to happen between minus 30 and minus 40 um, as a technique, we'll have a, a rescue plan. We'll have positive control. Someone will be watching our, our tracking device to watch that crew as they move along. And we'll have that, that, that also includes, we'll have the means to enact an immediate departure to go pick someone up because something as simple as a precautionary landing can turn into a survival situation as soon as the heat turns off. So those are some of the things we think about with the crew at those various temperature levels. As far as our aircraft goes, um, the frost, the frost and freeze cycles we found in the helicopters that that I find that uh, it's important that I know that all of the belly drain or all of the drain, low spot drain holes are open and stuff like that because it can become cumulative for building ice, especially if you have a bunch of water trapped in some area that has a drain plug that isn't open. You can add several pounds of ice internal and unbeknownst to the crew. So it's important that we do preventive maintenance and, and inspect our aircraft and clean all of the drain panels and plugs uh, thoroughly. And absolutely, once we get through the frost freeze cycle um, in Alaska, we went, we'll go for a little over 100 days where it'll never get above freezing. Once we're through going through the frost freeze cycle, We'll bring our aircraft into if we can or protect them and warm them up for a couple of days just to try to dry everything out. And then we'll put them out into a cold soaked environment. Um, aircraft will freeze to the ground when you're operating at that plus five and minus 18. That's another crew and operational uh, decision that we've trained some tactics and techniques for that. It's almost like muskeg tundra landing. You wanna ensure that the crews are trained to recognize that the aircraft has one or both skids or wheels frozen down and that they have a technique for either displacing the pedals left to right to break the to break the ice loose or terminate the takeoff and figure out what's going on maybe ground handle it and jack it up and put it back down but those are another thing that i have in the minus 18 to minus 30 there's there's a lot of components on aircraft that become incredibly brittle a lot of adl clamps and zip ties and things of that nature so during the pre-flight if people are hands-on it's not uncommon for a zip tie to just give up and, and snap and break. So there's some thought issues there. And there's also some wire bundle or some hose issues that could be interfering with stuff like that. Um, the TANIS systems and the preheat systems for aircraft where we plug them in, they're readily available. Uh, the TANIS system, I'm not endorsing any, uh, any, any uh, particular Heating system, but I can I can tell you with assurance, having 44 aircraft, the TANIS system works well in the Arctic environment. So um, we check those out and we have them operational before the winter sets on. One of the hazards hazards that I found with preheating aircraft in the Arctic environment is people who will use a catalytic or a propane type fed burner. Um, preheating preheating a cabin area or anything like that with a catalytic or a, a propane fed type burner induces a huge amount of moisture and aircraft will actually build a frost inside of them. So I would avoid that at all costs, not using any type of propane or fuel provided heat element. Electric heat works well if it's available. Um, and at a last resort, use a catalytic or a propane type heater. Those are some of the things we found in the Arctic. Um, anything colder than minus 30, you have to follow the, the the handbook and the operator's manual. Um, I would I would say that inversions are very common um, in the Arctic and subarctic, where the ground on the ground it may be minus thirty, and at four thousand feet it may be plus fifteen. Um, so there's cold sumps that come in, so aircraft will be exposed to rapid changes in temperatures as you operate at the altitudes. So I would in, implore that the crews have a, availability and aware of the temperature inversions and and are uh, familiar with the hazards that go along with changing from 50 degree temperature changes in a matter of a couple of minutes. Um, you can expect and see some pretty peculiar anomalies on some of your instruments. Um, and ensure the aircraft are configured for that type of, of, of environment with uh, some blocking plates or some oil coolers and things. It, every aircraft has a specific cold weather operation. It's imperative that the operations and managers and the maintenance prepare their aircraft for that type of environment. Um, 
as I said a little bit earlier, at the temperatures of uh, you know plus five to minus eighteen, um, we'll take a, all our missions. We'll employ our aircraft through the full spectrum of their capability. Um, it's imperative that you have your crews trained, the pilots and the ground crews. Make sure management is involved and allow extra time for the pre-flights and the post-flights. Um, minus 18 and minus 30 with the state troopers up here. Um, we uh, divide the mission up to where people take a break and warm before they depart. And uh, we ensure also another thing is we ensure that we do proper cool downs when you land your aircraft. I'm not sure how many Robinson operators we have. But the Robinson reciprocating engines, it's imperative in, in extreme cold weather to, to do an extended, if not a, a required, if not an extended cool down after you land to avoid the, the flash freezing of those engines and those valves. We've had a lot of exhaust valves sticking on those aircraft if it's minus 30 and you land and don't cool it off properly and give it some time to, to, to settle in. Um, below minus 30. I would consider uh, postponing the mission if it's not necessary. And if you do have to send it, consider either sending two aircraft with them or have a crew standing by that can follow along. Um, those are just some insights from uh, Anchorage and uh, I'm open to any questions. I appreciate your time. Thanks Cliff, that, that was great. Um, some great, awesome insight as reg regarding the, the different levels of cold. Uh, yeah, I think maybe we referred to that as crazy cold versus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and, and perhaps you know some of our participants won't won't enjoy that level of cold, but uh, I'm sure uh, those suggestions that you recommended, uh, I think, are, are critical. You know, I one question I have for you is like when when frost develops, like what what are some of the mitigating things that you all can do? Like if someone sees frost on on the on the top of their rotor blades? Well, frost is cumulative. There's a lot of advisory circulars and there's a lot of information out there on, on, the, uh, on the website. I mean, if, if, you're capable of, if you're capable of getting the aircraft in and warming it up and removing the frost in its entirety, um, you always hear stories about people using a chisel and whatever else to get it off. Um, the, the, the problems with frost and, and with covers, and I didn't I didn't mention that too, and thanks for bringing that up, is that a lot of folks, if you're in a blowing snow, if you're up in the Dakotas or someplace like that, and, you, and your helicopter is going to be exposed to a, um, a, a, a blowing snow or a windstorm, a lot of, a lot of discussion is where would, you, where would you put your aircraft if you can't put it inside? Would you put it behind trucks? Would you put it behind buildings, behind a snow fence? Or would you set it out right in the middle of everything and put the panels and the plugs in? Don't put the blade covers on and everything and just let your helicopter weather the storm, if you will. And is is it's almost counterintuitive to some, but and it was to me, and I'll just say that is that um, over time I've found that set your aircraft out in the in the brunt of the storm and let it create the snow fence and the berm to the snow drift to form behind it. Um, the uh, the putting it behind a shed or behind a truck has got us stuck many places because the snow drift will actually bury your helicopter. And that's really, really bad and hard to get that out of. So um, as far as frost, going back to your question is, is that you have to, you have to take into consideration that it will affect the performance of the aircraft and it is a safety issue and it needs to be treated as such. You need to take the time to figure a way to find a way to warm the aircraft or use de-icing fluid and remove the frost to not create an unnecessary hazard. And, and you're just stacking the cards against yourself if you do things, if you don't, if you don't take the time. For sure. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice. We did have a question come in um, from Jeff Johnson. How long uh, a cool down do you recommend on an R44? And Tim Tucker uh, graciously uh, from, from Robinson is online as well. He, uh, he, he put in the chat for R22 and R44, let engine warm, let warm engine up before engaging the clutch. I don't know, Tim, I'm going to, I'm going to click, allow you to talk. And I don't know if you want to specifically address the, the cool down side uh, of that question. Uh, Tim, are, are you on? Yeah. Can you hear me? I, we sure can. Thank you. Okay, my my thing in the in the chat was really on startup. Uh, we've had issues uh, where people go to engage the clutch, and that just lugs the engine down. The engine quits. So we actually uh, 
would recommend letting the engine warm up all the way until the cylinder head temperature is in the green before engaging the clutch. Now, years ago, that used to be a problem, but with the new uh, upper and lower sheaves that we have, that's not a problem anymore. So really warm the engine up quite a bit before engaging the clutch. On shutdown, it would be a significant, we would call it a significant decrease in cylinder head temperature, probably way below the three in 350 uh, would be uh, what we would recommend. Awesome, Tim. Very, very fortunate to, to have you participate today. You know, talk about subject matter expert uh, <laughs> regarding the question. So thank you for answering that question. And hopefully for Jeff, it, it said, it said that was a satisfactory uh, uh, response. And then uh, back to Cliff, um, just want to say thank you again. I, I don't see any other questions uh, in queue. So uh, with that, uh, we'll, we'll end uh, your, your portion. And uh, just again, thank you for that that knowledge uh, guidance uh, for folks uh, with, with these cold weather operations. Maybe not as crazy cold as, as you have, but uh, certainly uh, probably something close to it or, or near. So thank you again for that. All right, thank you. Thank you everyone. And uh, I'm always available on the state of Alaska website at the aircraft section. And I look forward to chatting with anybody about helicopters any time of the day, it beats working. <laughs> exactly. I think as pilots and mechanics in the rotorcraft industry, we're always happy to divert from real work and <laughs> talk about the cool stuff with, with vertical lift. <laughs> All right, we'll, uh, we'll move on. James, if you could, uh, let's, let's transition to our next question. Yeah, okay. As we pull it up, we get into the maintenance section. Have you ever been injured from falling while working on or pre-flighting the aircraft? Um, yes or no? Yeah, a little history on that one is, I, I always got nervous with the crew chiefs working on our cranes when I uh, did a stint at Columbia Helicopters. So um, yeah, people climbing up on those. Uh, yeah, I'm personally scared of heights, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we got about 45%, 50% uh, now that uh, have, have provided responses. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and throw, throw that up there now, let everyone see. Uh, the, sorry about that, everyone. Let me try killing that. Um, yeah, well, the good news is a majority 70% no. Uh, I'm sorry for the 30%. So with yeah. that, let's uh, hand it over to Duke. All right, Duke, if you can come up on the camera for me. I don't see you yet. Hang on, uh, Chris, I don't... All right, I got audio on you, but no, no, no visual. But it, whatever works best for you. So we're just glad to have you with us. There you are. Oh, there I am. Sorry. Right. Well, Duke, just let, let's do a, a quick intro. Uh, I'll let you, you know, tell it like it is, uh, and, and who you are, and, and what you do, and, and, and who you work for. Uh, I work for. I'm a safety officer for Siller Helicopters, like you know, and we're a heavy lift operator located in. Uh, Central California, mostly we do uh, firefighting and heavy lift operations. The company has been in effect for 40 some odd years. We have four large cranes and two 61s. And uh, that's it. Well, um, but also, you know, you're not a pilot, right? No, that's probably not. That's, I'm sorry to say that. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> I'm for, the, I'm for the maintenance side of the house, I've been uh, working. I started on cranes in 1977, and I've been uh, have uh, many, many, many years of field experience, and been lucky to work for the the sillers, of uh, specifically in field maintenance. Awesome. Well, I know. I know with past conversations with you, uh, the topic of field maintenance is. Uh, always been a uh, near and dear to your heart and in, in, in the challenges of, of field maintenance. Um, I, saw the, I saw the whole run, I, you know, uh, to me, it's a, it's a hot topic. Like you say, Chris, it really gets me going. Uh, uh, thankfully, people are starting to realize that field maintenance is a very, very important part of operations. And uh, it's uh, a, uh, 
So I've been at it for quite a few years and I'm very insistent that our, that our company, which luckily enough does a lot to help out our field maintenance people and make them safer actually. Well, I was just going to ask you, what, what, what are some of the challenges that you've observed uh, that compared to, and there's challenges both in the field and, you know, working in the hangar on the flight line, but what, what, what are some of those challenges that you, you see and perhaps maybe some solutions that you've been able to, to implement? We've int- implemented a lot of solutions, Chris. There's a lot of challenges. People uh, feel that uh, uh, grab the aircraft and head out for the summer, take some, uh, take some rags with you, a box of oil, and a cell phone and, and, and we'll see at the end of summer, that's, those days are long since gone. Our operations uh, that we do and our, as, as our competitors also is we have uh, maintenance trailers that are outfitted that look exactly like our hangar. They've got the manuals, the communications, they've got calibrated tools, they have a full uh, array of consumable parts. Uh, you have to support these people. When, when, when someone leaves the hangar, uh, they're out there by themselves. They, they need, uh, you know, they can't reach, they can't go back in the hangar and ask somebody, hey, well, what about this? What about that? They're, they're, they need all the support they can. They've got to be a, a facility as if it was still in the hangar. And we uh, try to mitigate that with uh, making sure they have all the manuals, the communications, sat phones, these beautiful cell phones that are around nowadays that they have consumables, that they have uh, testing equipment, that they have uh, everything that, that they can, you know, like. It's not just a trailer with a with a, a lounge chair and a, and a coffee maker anymore. That's what <laughs> Although those are important items, no doubt. They are. <laughs> <laughs> but but in particular, I, you know, we, with a question that we had leading into this about, you know, falling, you know, fall hazards, you know, I know we've had conversations about you know, what kinds of uh, ladders are, are uh, applicable to the field versus the hangar? I know that's an issue too, where, you know, sometimes what works in the hangar and the shop environment or the flight line clearly doesn't work in the field, right? Right. So, you know, you see these beautiful uh, uh, ladders and, and it steps and, and uh, things that you have at the hangar for pushing up against the aircraft out in the field there on broken ground, you know, you're lucky to get on and off. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, uh, how do you call it, a warrior for, for making sure that the guys and the guys and the girls out there have the right stuff because I've fallen three times. I just heard the gentleman before saying, you know, he was uh, terrified of watching the guys on the crane. I've been up there all my life and I've fallen off there three different occasions. You know, one time hospitalized for 14 months. Uh, it's, it's near and dear to me. It's, uh, it's important that the guys have access to lifting mechanisms, uh, scissor lifts, whatever you can find that you could make the job safer. Yeah. What, what kind of uh, tooling specifically helps in the field versus, uh, you know, back at the, the operation, the hangar? Tooling. Well, here's a simple one that no people forget. Uh, they, they send their uh, employees out there for the summer, or for the winter. Uh, all they have is a flashlight or a headlamp. We, we, we've got the side of our maintenance facilities are lit up with uh, LEDs. We try to light that night up like uh, the aircraft up like it's, like it's still in the hangar. I mean, you've got to get some light on the subject. When people are moving around on an aircraft and, and working in the dark, there's the dark side to everything. One step and, and you're, in, you know, you're free falling in space. Uh, you've got to make it extremely safe for, uh, as much as you can. You've got to, you've got to help them minimize this, this threat. Uh, yeah. uh, you've got to make sure that they've got uh, air conditioning, you know, just like uh, the gentleman spoke a minute ago about minus 30. I worked in Alaska, Southern Alaska, the Charlottes, Northern British Columbia with he- heavy aircraft and the cold was, was paramount. Well, now the heat's paramount, uh, you know, 30 degree C, uh, uh, 30 degrees of, of hot temperature uh, is, it's, it, it affects people. It, you burn your hands. Uh, you, you touch a, a stainless steel engine or a titanium engine deck that's been sitting in the sun all day, you're going to get a burn. You've got to make sure that people have got the, the equipment. This, this has got equipment. It can't be up to you, Chris, to go buy this equipment. This is issued to you uh, as, as the company issues it to for you. Yeah, you bring up personal protective equipment, right? You know, having the right, the right clothing and, you know, the, the right you know, harnessing systems or the, the right, you know, right. equipment to, 
keep you cool or hot depending on the environment and i'm sure it changes you know especially if you're moving around the, the country we've, got, we've recently uh, uh purchased all uh air conditioning units in our in our in our trailers so the guys can get a few minutes and cool off uh you know the aircraft flies for eight hours a day and the poor guys are sitting there guys and girls are sitting there uh, uh cooking on the ground and then now you expect them to get up and work the next six or eight hours post-flighting it and they got to be the best of their game that's a pretty tall order for sure so i, I know you all have a safety management system uh, at Siller helicopters how how have you you worked diligently towards your maintenance folks being very focused on risk management and risk mitigation what you know what kind of things have you done done well, to help encourage folks to, to participate on the from the maintenance perspective. Well, you know, personally that uh, you were the biggest reason we uh, asked you to come in and help us uh, quite a few years ago, start up our SMS program and uh, we got buy-in. Thanks to your help and to our management's help, we got buy-in from the management. So that was step one. Once we got the buy-in from Andrew and, and Tom, then it was a matter of uh, working on the guys and we had a culture change and you saw that when you came. We had a 40 year old culture that wasn't uh, that participant in, in safety in the safety culture and it was it was a tough go. Uh, uh, my our SMS program, uh, I feel it's not working in 100% Chris, we don't have uh, we don't have a perfect safety system by any stretch of imagination. Uh, you've got to be used to seeing small changes if you're going to stay in safety. Uh, and uh, we are continually striving to go ahead, but our system is working. We have, thank God, more precautionary landings now than we ever have with the company. Uh, I'm seeing uh, reports, uh, four, five, six precautionary landings a year. We should never have any. The only precautionary landings we had years ago was when something blew up and you had to land. Those are the only landings we ever had. Now, thank God, our, 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 our uh, pilots, our uh, air side of the house, you know, if something's wrong, they head for the ground. They're going to have, they're going to bring a maintenance guy out. They'll bring a guy, maintenance will fly a guy out there. We'll fly a guy out there or a girl out there to have a look and, oh no, it's nothing but a wire. Oh no, it's nothing but a fuse. Don't worry about it. We'll get it fixed. We'll go on. But years ago, people charged ahead. They just kept going until something stopped. I think, well, I think the SMS program has made a difference. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And you bring up some really important factors related to culture and changing changing uh, beliefs and values within your organization. It's not easy, it takes a long time. It does. Uh, it, and I, I agree, you know, I don't think anyone has a perfect SMS, you know, and, and you know, the whole purpose around safety management is continuous improvement and identifying We're opportunities working. that you could do things better or enhance uh, safety with, with better risk control or risk mitigation. So, you know, that's it, a great point you make. Uh, just, uh, just the last question to ask you, you know, what, what recommendations would you, you have for a, a maintenance technician to, to not only enhance their own safety, but their organizations. Jesus, you're, you're talking to me. You're, that, that question's pointed right at me. And I was, I've been in that boat and still am in that boat. Uh, the, 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 the thing is, the one thing that I could say, you know, it's easy for me to say it now, I'm 60 plus years of age, uh, stick with it, keep trying. Uh, uh, you, you can't see it. I want everything changed tomorrow. Everything's not gonna change tomorrow in any organization. I'll tell you that right now, it just won't happen. So keep trying, keep pushing for little changes, one little change at a time. And then like, you, like you've seen and I've seen with the company that I'm with right now, 10 years later, stuff has changed, but you've got to stay in it. You've got to stay in the game. You've got to keep pushing. Uh, reach out to your management, your policy. Luckily enough, we had a policy from our management that says nothing will, this is from Tom Siller, uh, nothing will be more, uh, I forget his exact words, I'm, I'm, I'm ad living here. Nothing will be more uh, important than the safety of the operation. If at any time, any person in the company think there's something's not safe, please shut down. So that's your, that's our get out of jail free card. That's, that's the card that the guys and the girls use in the field. When, when somebody says, hey, let's go do this, you say, listen, let's call up Tom, let's call up Andrew and say, Andrew, is it okay if we fly into a, into a windstorm and, you know, or into, is it okay if we fly at night? Is it, and you, the manager's gonna come right back and say, no, we don't want you to do that. That's the furthest thing from our mind. Uh, be safe, you know, uh, value the uh, way that, the, uh, take a hard look at what you're doing. And luckily enough, 
that's in our policy and and our guys and girls use it. That's awesome. That's a pretty pretty powerful message and you know, it is clearly, clearly it's it's made a uh, positive change within your organization i'm sure I believe, I believe it has chris and i think you saw it before you left the sms company that you were with well duke i i, I certainly appreciate it. i don't see any questions uh from yeah. our participants out there but um if anyone uh does have questions please uh please don't hesitate to put them in the chat and we'll, we'll try to get those answered but you know, Duke, your, your perspective from, especially from, from the maintenance side, I, I know that's tended, tended to be a challenge for a lot of folks uh, in the past and, and, and tended to be a, a hard a hard shift, if you will, in culture. And, and I'm just glad to see that through perseverance, through buy-in, uh, through dedication and engagement, you all have, have, have moved in, in the right direction. So thank I, you. I have, Chris, uh, had questions from other people um, uh, from HAI, when I've been at HAI with you, uh, people that come up to you in maintenance say, you know, I just, I, you know, I'm having trouble. I can't make any inroads. And, and uh, a lot of people in maintenance feel like no one ever listens to me. And, uh, you know, I'm a short guy on the, uh, on the totem pole. And you just got to say, listen, you've got to keep going. You've got to, you, you, you've got it. You're, <laughs> you just got to keep trying. I don't know what else to say. I really don't. Yeah, I agree. Perseverance, no doubt. Perseverance. Well, thank you very much, Duke. Uh, thank you. Appreciate your insight and your input as always. Uh, great job. And uh, we're going to transition to another uh, maintenance topic right now. So thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks no, for having me on. Thank you. All right, James uh, Sutherland, do you want to do our next question? Yep. All right. Um, helicopter pre flight after heavy maintenance is the topic. After performing heavy maintenance on an aircraft, what additional precautions do you uh, take most frequently? Uh, verify all tools are accounted for and requesting a quality check from another qualified AMT QA inspector, planning a conservative te flight test, all the above, none of the above. I do these things every time anyway. Uh, walk through the mechanic, walk through with the mechanics. Um, all of the work accomplished. So again, um, yeah, please respond. And uh, yeah, Chris, let, let us know when uh, we're getting close. Okay, we've got about 42% that have uh, anticipated. Let that build up a little bit. About 55 now, kind of slowing down, 57. Any last minute uh, clicks, go ahead and put them in there. All right, why don't we go ahead and post those. All right, all the above. Uh, majority uh, wins that one with 65%. Um, verify all tools, 4%. Planning a conservative test flight, 4%. None of the above, 13% and walk through with the mechanics, 13%. So thank you everyone for your responses. And with that, let's uh, hand it over to James uh, Dangerfield. Hey everyone, welcome and thank you for attending. Let me get this cranked up. Okay. Hey, first off, I wanna to apologize to a couple of the attendees. You may have read my SPANS announcements for my briefing. And some of, some of the uh, individuals assumed that was a start time for UHST's event. And I apologize, that was a rough estimate on when my briefing would start. Um, uh, I'm an Airworthiness Fast Team Program Manager. Uh, my name is James Dangerfield. I'm with the Columbia, South Carolina Flight Standards District Office. And I've worked on helicopters since around 1985. I started out with Cobra helicopters in the Army and later Apaches, Kiowas, A-Stars, or AS350 um, aircraft. Bell 206s, Bell 407s, and BK-117s. Um, this includes stints with Rocky Mountain Helicopters, Air Methods, Omni Flight, and full-time with the South Carolina Army National Guard. I also co-own a public service helicopter business called Copter Doctors, working on OH-58s. And I also participate in an organization called the Rotorcraft Collective, uh, who Chris Hill supports us with, and also Charlie Hamilton. Of course, Chris Hill is with USHST. 
And we have a video presentation on this helicopter pre-flight after heavy maintenance. It should be published on the FAA YouTube channel within the next week or two. And what we're going to do is I'm going to cover some areas that you should look at when you do a, uh, a pre-flight after heavy helicopter maintenance. I'm also going to give you some mitigation strategies to prevent accidents and give you a couple of new processes here to handle uh, a pre-flight after heavy maintenance. This is my first case study. This is really the only case study we're going to go over, and it's going to be pretty quick. Uh, I'll read it first, though. It's a Bell 407. And it happened on July 2016 at around 1123 Central Daylight Time. A Bell 407 helicopter, November 427 Tango Victor, collided with terrain during the approach to landing at the Tennessee Valley Authority in Hickory, Kentucky. The commercial pilot was fatally injured and the helicopter was substantially damaged by impact forces and ended up on its right side. The flight originated from Outlaw Field Airport in Clarksville, Tennessee, at 1048 Central Daylight Time in order to pick up a lineman to inspect power lines and equipment. Um, this case study was chosen because it there were a lot of opportunities to catch this, this problem. And uh, so that's why I selected it. And the other thing I wanna mention is all of these organizations involved in this are very professional organizations. Um, and, you know, things happen and they make mistakes and you'll see where some corrections were made from this event. This is an example of the helicopter. This is not the actual tail number, of course, but this is what it would have looked like. And of course, this is what it looked like after the crash. So here's a little scenario of what exactly happened when the aircraft crashed. Its rotors basically chopped into the ground, causing the airframe to bounce up and down. And the trauma from this probably contributed to the injuries that killed the pilot. The pilot's organization did not require pilots to wear helmets when they flew, but after this accident, they required them. And of course, uh, I have the question on the slide. It says, how many hours had this aircraft flown after maintenance before it crashed? Um, Y'all think about that for a second. And of course, this is what, what caused the accident. And you can see on the slide, it, it was 38 hours of flight time before the accident occurred after the maintenance was conducted. Um, it, the aircraft had a 24 month inspection that required examination of the flight control bolts and nuts. The collective lever pins, which is what actually came out, were not specifically included in that inspection. Two mechanics and a maintenance foreman, all employees of the operator, performed the maintenance and all reported during the post-accident interviews they don't recall removing the safety wire or examining the pins. And of course, this was a 24-month um, inspection is why they were doing this uh, work. So here's what, whenever the NTSB got there in the FAA, they took a photograph on the left, and this is what they found. And of course, it's pretty obvious that's what caused the accident. Um, over to the right, you see an example of what it should have looked like. Now, uh, the NTSB also mentioned that the company's maintenance personnel uh, inappropriately removed um, the pins and the safety wire during their re recent maintenance, which resulted in the screws backing out and led to a loss of collective control and flight. And I'll have another slide and I'll show you um, what it could have looked like um, before the accident. So how many pre-flights do you think they did on this aircraft? Think about that for a minute. Um, and we know, I, I, I was a crew chief in the Army. I was not a helicopter pilot, but I was a crew chief. Uh, and I am a fixed wing pilot, but we know that when you fly a helicopter, about four hours for each flight is probably about right uh, because it can be pretty rough if you go much longer than that. So that's about nine to 10 flights with three different pilots performing pre-flight since maintenance was done. Maintenance was done. Um, I did actually talk to the NTSB investigator that was involved in this case and got a lot of this data from him. Um, 
And then, of course, the aircraft flew nine flight days before the major maintenance event and the accident. One thing I'll mention, of course, and we all know this, is accomplish a pre-flight with the manufacturer's flight manual. So here's some mitigation strategies to think about. Look at the work done before the covers and panels go on. You know, this is something we all take for granted. Um, we don't always do the, uh, the pre-flight before heavy maintenance. We don't always have the panels off that can be left off to actually look at the, uh, the parts that were worked on. And of course, we know the military is very strict about this. They have a maintenance test pilot who completes test flights on an aircraft before other pilots can fly it. Those test pilots do review all maintenance done and most look at the work areas on the aircraft. Uh, I've been on many of maintenance uh, check flights with pilots and uh, I had some really good ones who really dug in deep and actually looked at everything. Um, as you can see on this, this Bell 47, uh, the cowling is off in this picture and you can see the arrow pointing to about where those collective lever pins would be. With the cowling on, all you have is a little maybe six by six inch door that you can open and look in there and you don't have much light to see actually what, what would be there or missing. So always recommend if you can, if you can also do the run up without a panel that's safe, we'll cover that here in a minute. You may want to consider that also. So, and here's another question. Did you perform a leak check prior to the flight? Uh, always perform a ground run, ensure there's no leaks or other issues before flight. Do it with all the covers closed. It could interfere with operation. If there is a leak, of course, fix it before flight. Um, there are some panels you cannot take off when you do a, a run up on an aircraft like this 407. The particle separator is a good example. You can't take that off because you need the particle separator installed to run the aircraft. Um, but if it is something you can leave off safely and look at the actual areas you worked on, that's great to do. Of course, always, I always highly recommend that the uh, pilot gets with the mechanic and does the actual pre-flight. It's at least, I mean, if you do it the first couple of times, you'll learn so much from the mechanics that you may or may not know. So here are some mitigation strategies when you're doing that pre-flight, some areas to look for. Y'all may be aware of most of these, these uh, processes, but I figured I'd cover them just to be on the safe side. So here's some areas you wanna look at at pre-flight after maintenance. You know, there's different kinds of filters on each helicopter. And this, is, this particular one is the hydraulic system on a Bell 206 or 407. Uh, there's the little red circle in the picture. Of course, that's a bypass uh, filter indicator. If it pops up, you're going to see it, and it's going to let you know that there's a bypass indicator, which could indicate that the, uh, the filter is clogged or some other issue could be happening. That's the same for fuel and any other kind of system that has a, a bypass uh, button on it. Some other areas to look at, if you have an air, a helicopter with uh, a sight glass, um, be aware that you can also have a stained background that could maybe look like there's oil in the, the sight glass when it's not. Or if you have a lot of crazing on those plastic sight glasses, you need to get it replaced or write it up for the mechanic to replace it. That crazing will make it really hard to see if there's any kind of glare in there. Maybe the sun's going through the cowling and, and making the uh, sight, sight level hard to read. This is actually a good sight uh, panel and uh, lens that you're looking at in this picture. And of course, slippage marks. Uh, you know, airplane guys don't necessarily have to worry about this as much as helicopter guys because we have so much vibration happening on a helicopter. But slippage marks are critical. Um, this example happens to be a pneumatic line on a, any kind of Bell helicopter. It's very critical, and I'm sure there's other helicopters it's also critical on. But make sure that slippage mark hasn't cracked. If it has cracked, make sure the mechanic replaces it. Um, and then also make sure you grab those fittings sometimes of course, as mentioned earlier, make sure that the aircraft's not hot when you do this um, from a previous run up, but, but grab those things sometimes and make sure they're not loose. It's a good idea to always check them. Um, this is an example. I kind of I kind of photoshopped this image to show you kind of an extreme example of what you need to look for. 
Uh, a lot of bell products have, and, and other products have swaged bearings. Um, so if you don't know what staked or swage bearings are, basically this is the uh, pitch control horn on a bell 407, or actually I think this is a 206. Um, and swaged bearings basically have the special device that spins around them and it actually bends the metal out to hold it in place. And so the example on the left, if you put a slippage mark on that bearing, uh, make sure it doesn't touch the rotating surface over here, but if the slippage marks cracks, it will look like this, which means this whole bearing is spinning around in the pitch horn. Um, so make sure, and you can actually see at the very top of this one, of both of these pictures, someone has put a slippage mark in there that's white um, to see if the uh, bearing has rotated when it shouldn't be rotating. Um, some other areas to look at, and of course, this is on an A-Star or an AS350 uh, made by Airbus now. Um, the elastomeric bearings, that is one area you really need to check uh, very in, in detail. Uh, on an on a AS350 or an A-Star, you would actually take the, uh, the tail rotor blades and push them away from you, and you can actually look uh, on this top right corner. You'll see an example of what the elastomeric bearing looks up close, and on the bottom right corner, you'll see where the elastomeric bearing is, is damaged and it's starting to um, lose the rubber surface it's supposed to have. So definitely get with your mechanic and make sure he checks the maintenance manual see how much uh, uh, wear and damage and deterioration you can have on that elastomeric bearing. Um, this is a isolation mount stop uh, on the bottom of Bell helicopter. If that stop's been banging up against the metal, you'll see the deterioration you'll see on the right. And you'll also see that uh, area that could be missing or damaged. You wanna definitely look, look at that. Make sure that mount's not hitting, which indicates your isolation mount is, is not deteriorating or working properly. This is underneath the uh, helicopter transmission. And of course, um, loose flight control jam nuts. Now here's what you want to look for on this type of uh, this type of push pull tube or control. There's holes drilled in these controls. And if you extend the, uh, the lollipop out too far, it allows you to put safety wire into that hole and it'll actually go all the way through the tube. Um, when it's installed properly and adjusted correctly, you should be able to put safety wire in there and it should only extend maybe uh, a tiny bit you'll definitely know if, it, if it's going too far. Um, but that means that the lollipop is extended out so far that only maybe a thread or two is holding it in place. So always check it with a piece of safety wire. If it goes in too deep, it's, it's uh, incorrectly adjusted and it could break loose. So make sure that safety wire doesn't go all the way into the, uh, the, the pitch change link or whatever you're checking or the control. Another area, this is, of course, uh, there's a lot of Bell helicopter information in here because there's a lot to look at. Um, if you're looking at the tail rotor drive shafts, um, always look to make sure your flex plate bevel washers are installed properly. And the image on the left shows the, uh, the actual machining of the, the washer um, that sits against the uh, flex plate. There is a new version of this washer that's actually beveled on both sides. It goes in between uh, two flex plates. Uh, but always make sure that beveled edge is resting against the stainless steel flex plate. That keeps it from damage and cutting the um, actual flex plate. It's really hard to see in the picture, and that's why I kind of drew it over here on the left. Do we have any questions coming in right now, Chris, um, that we need to answer while we've only got a few more slides to go? No, you're doing good. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is what the aircraft that, that, that had the aircraft accident look like on the left. This is a, a artist rendering on the left of what it looked like while it was flying. Of course, the screw would have been tight in this example, but that screw started backing out because it did not have the safety wire on either side. And of course, there's a picture again, what it should have looked like. So, um, what do you need to know when you do uh, a pre-flight after maintenance? Double check your maintenance manual, see what it says. That's the number one thing. 
verify if it needs a ground run or a maintenance test blank. Um, if you're not sure, make sure. There's other accident case studies where uh, people have pre-flighted or they've actually done a test flight and not followed the maintenance manuals. Any any questions, Chris? That's all I've got. Um, well, I haven't seen any questions come in yet, James, but uh, we'll wait a few minutes. Um, I will say that this, this is great information. I appreciate you putting this together and I'm looking forward to the video uh, coming out soon. Um, I, it's a critical uh, point, I think, for all of us, uh, whether you're a maintenance technician or a uh, pilot, you know, is to, to make sure that we're thorough with that kind of closing out any kind of work that's being done and then getting ready to take that aircraft flying. Um, I know personally, I've experienced situations where I found as a pilot, I'm not a maintenance technician, but as a pilot, I found things that, you know, maybe uh, weren't properly safety wired or uh, maybe there, there wasn't a, a slip mark even there where it should be, or even a, maybe a potential tool uh, being left behind. And I think it's important to emphasize, stress that it's not about finding someone at fault or finding someone that did something wrong. It's more about helping one another and just the professionalism and dedication that we all have, you know, because certainly pilots make mistakes. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we yeah. break a lot of things. Right. And so uh, yeah. thankfully you maintenance technicians are there to help, you know, fix the things that we, we broke, but um, it's, it's more again about helping one another and, and you know, having that extra set of eyes uh, to, to, to follow you uh, through your work and then getting ready for uh, uh, your flight, you know, that it's critical to, to be overly thorough, uh, especially following some type of heavy maintenance where maybe a, a, a part that's a critical characteristic or something was, was uh, worked on or replaced or, or touched, you know, and, you know, we just, you know, we just got to be super thorough. And for, for private pilots, you know, they may not have the luxury of, of knowing exactly the, the, the maintenance technician that did the work and, you know, maybe, you know, that, that, that's, that work is outsourced. And, and so again, as a private pilot, you know, bring a friend along, you know, uh, do, do a pre-flight twice, different directions, you know, just anything you can do to, to make sure that, that everything is in order and, and, and properly uh, set, you know, you know for, for flight. Yeah, Chris, I agree. And most maintenance technicians will appreciate you. If you find a mistake they've made, they'll appreciate it because they want to get it right and make sure you're safe in that aircraft. So uh, most aircraft mechanics are very conscientious. Yeah, no, that's good. And, you know, again, it's a, it's a team effort in anything that we do, uh, but especially in aviation, especially when we think about safety management, risk management, and safety assurance, you know, all the, the, the pillars of an SMS, it's, a, it's critical that we do that together. It's, it's, it's not one side or the other. It's it's collectively uh, and, and working towards an ultimate goal of you know keeping that aircraft safe and keeping each other safe. Thank you, Chris. That sounds good. Yep. Well, I, again, I didn't see any uh, any other questions that came in. I know we're a few minutes past our, our end time, and I apologize uh, uh, to everyone, but appreciate uh, everyone that uh, stuck around. And um, I, I don't have any further uh, questions. Uh, um, James uh, Sutherland, did you have anything that you wanted to, to put out there? Other than that, um, yeah, obviously we're, we're trying to work both uh, through uh, the UHST and um, on the FA side, again, this is a, a group uh, where we're trying to come together and improve safety overall. So obviously if anybody, any of the operators, um, out there have specific questions or areas of concern that's kind of what we're here for to bring those in so we can help reduce those uh, uh, any accidents and especially fatal accidents so it's kind of a, a request out to everybody hey is there anything else that uh, is out there that um, you now may, we may be missing we're obviously looking at a lot of uh, things between uh, this group and on the FA side, but yeah, you guys are out in the field every day. We'd like to hear back from you, so. Yeah, thanks, James. A lot of great resources available on the USHST website. 
I showed a link for the HAI's uh, website and the spotlight on safety videos that Chris Hill and his team worked diligently to put together. And, and of course, you know, James and, and Charlie with the new uh, maintenance after a heavy maintenance video that's going to be coming out as well. Um, a lot of great tools out there, resources for everybody. So I encourage you to go access that, learn from it and, and, and share it as well. So um, I don't, I think that's it for, for all of us. I appreciate uh, everyone's uh, participation today and uh, I hope you all have a wonderful remainder of your holiday season. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in, in the new year. Yep. Again, uh, thank you everyone. And uh, Karen, do you have any uh, final remarks? No, uh, just have a, have a safe, happy holiday. And for Nick, uh, keep it in the green. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Take Thanks, care. Thanks, everyone.